I gave my daughter a DNA test for her birthday and found out that she was not my own child and learned that my wife had cheated on me 19 years ago. I suddenly had a shocking realization, like when a character in a cartoon gets a light bulb above their head upon figuring something out. I discovered that my fourth child wasn't actually biologically mine. She belonged to another man. I was on the phone with a representative from genealogy experts, trying to find out why my daughter's DNA test hadn't been processed after nearly 12 weeks. I had given it to her as a birthday gift and was growing frustrated with the delay. After providing the representative with the necessary information to track it down, he put me on hold for what felt like an eternity. When he finally returned, he assured me the test had been processed. However, he added that it was a confidential matter between the company and the individual who took the test, so he couldn't share any more details with me. Confused, I asked, if you processed it, why doesn't it show up in my DNA results? I was genuinely curious and somewhat hopeful. The representative, sounding a bit exasperated, replied, Sir, there are multiple reasons why your daughter may not appear in your DNA matches, but I can't discuss this specific test with you. That's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. The most likely reason she didn't show up in my matches was because she wasn't biologically related to me. I ended the call in a daze, barely able to process the information. I remember pressing the red button to end the call, then collapsing on the couch, where I broke down in tears. I must have dozed off because I woke up a while later still curled up in the living room, with just under 20 minutes left on my break. I decided to call my daughter, who I figured might also be on her lunch break. We lived in the same time zone, and I knew she often enjoyed her lunch while reading at her desk, so I wasn't too worried about interrupting her. She picked up on the first ring, her voice sounding a bit tired. Hey dad, how are you? She asked. I responded, sweetie, you know I love you and trust you completely, but I found out about the DNA test. I called the genealogy company, and they told me it was processed about four weeks ago. There was a brief silence on the other end, and I could hear her take a deep breath. I know, dad. We need to talk, but I can't do it right now. Call me tonight, and please make sure mom isn't around when you do. The rest of the day was a blur as I drove back to the office. I work at a construction firm as the VP of operations, and to be honest, my productivity that afternoon was non-existent. My mind was racing with all sorts of thoughts, particularly the terrifying possibility that my dear daughter wasn't really mine. Being someone who likes to think things through, I knew I needed to tackle this issue methodically. After all, there's a reason I've climbed the ranks to become VP. My mentor, Hank, instilled in me the importance of handling personal issues like their project challenges, and it's an approach that has served me well over the years. Hank was the founder of our company, and he hired me right out of college when the firm was just starting to gain momentum. With Hank at the helm and me as his right-hand man, the company grew into a major player in the industry. I've had a successful career, with a great salary, fantastic benefits, and colleagues I enjoy working with. Plus, when I get home each evening, I have a wonderful wife, three great kids, and a comfortable life waiting for me. As the kids grew up, moved out, and started families of their own, our house started to feel a bit empty. But Tracy and I found ways to keep ourselves busy, and in many ways, the quiet gave us a chance to reconnect as a couple. However, as I reflected on the last few weeks, I couldn't help but think about some odd moments that had happened recently. For instance, Tracy received a call from Leah, our eldest, about a month ago. We were watching TV in the living room when Tracy's phone rang. She glanced at the screen and told me it was Leah before answering. The call lasted only about eight minutes, during which Tracy mostly gave short responses, but I noticed tears welling up in her eyes. When she hung up, I asked if everything was okay. She brushed it off, saying Leah's dog was having some health issues. I found it strange how deeply she seemed to be affected by Leah's dog's condition. Little did I know at the time that this might have been the moment Leah discovered the truth. Tracy had no idea I had sent Leah the DNA test. I hadn't mentioned it to anyone because I didn't think it was a big deal. Leah was the only one of our four kids who showed any interest in genealogy, so I thought she would appreciate it. I've been researching my family tree for years and have always been fascinated by DNA testing. I assumed Leah would jump at the chance to learn more about our ancestry, but clearly, I was wrong. When I got home that evening, I made a conscious effort not to treat Tracy any differently, even though I was seething inside. 
I kept repeating to myself, tackle one problem at a time. One problem at a time. Tracy and I met during my junior year at the university. We didn't start dating until my senior year. But once we did, we were inseparable. We got married a year after graduating, which was now exactly 29 years ago. I've always considered marrying Tracy the best decision I've ever made. At 52, she still looks amazing, and despite having four kids, she's maintained a fitness routine that keeps her looking like she's in her 30s. She's full of energy and humor, and until today, I couldn't imagine spending my life with anyone else. At 9.30 that evening, I told Tracy I needed to make a work call and excused myself from the room. In reality, I grabbed my coat and headed to the porch swing to have some privacy for the conversation I was about to have with Leah. She picked up immediately, and I could hear the distress in her voice. I'm sorry, Dad. I should have told you earlier, but Mom asked me to keep quiet until she had a chance to talk to you, she whispered before I could even say hello. Hey, I'm not mad at you, I replied, trying to keep my voice calm and reassuring. Take a deep breath. You're not to blame for this. I just want you to know that this doesn't change anything between us. I'm still your dad, and you'll always be my little girl. Leah broke down in tears, and I could barely make out her words through her sobs. I love you, dad. I don't need anyone else but you. I told her that I wasn't trying to put her on the spot, but I needed to know if she had any DNA matches. She sighed and revealed that Sarah Thompson turned out to be her half-sister. I was stunned and asked if she meant Sarah, Uncle Mike, and Aunt Liz's daughter. She quietly confirmed. I reassured her that she had nothing to apologize for and that she should never feel guilty. This revelation meant that Mike Thompson, who my kids knew as Uncle Mike, was Leah's biological father. It also implied that Tracy had been involved with Mike when he was her boss at the law firm, over 23 years ago, considering Leah is 23 now. At that time, Tracy was working as his assistant. Mike later left the firm to become a prominent judge in the state capitol, where his career flourished. Meanwhile, Tracy stayed with the firm, eventually becoming the office manager. During the few years they worked together, Mike and Liz became close friends of ours, so much so that our children called them Uncle Mike and Aunt Liz. There were even times when I was out of town on business, and Tracy and the kids would spend a few days at Mike and Liz's lake cabin. It never crossed my mind that anything was amiss. The kids often talked about how Aunt Liz took them on outings, and I never suspected anything. I must have missed a lot of clues. I was deep in thought when I heard Leah calling out to me on the phone. I apologized, telling her I got lost in thought, and thanked her for helping me figure this out. I also asked her to say hi to Josh, her husband, for me. Leah then asked me what I planned to do. I admitted I wasn't sure, to which she advised me not to do anything reckless. She said a little bit of foolishness was okay, but nothing that would get me arrested. I hadn't even considered harming Tracy until that moment, but I promised Leah that I wouldn't do anything that would get me locked up. I've never broken a promise to my kids, and I wasn't about to start now. My first priority was to reassure Leah that nothing would change between us. Next, I needed to find out who Tracy's accomplice in this betrayal was. The third item on my list was to initiate divorce proceedings but I knew I'd need to find a new lawyer since our current one worked at the same firm where Tracy was employed. That was definitely out of the question. After consulting with a new lawyer and getting everything in order, I'd then have to confront Tracy. When I got home, I tried not to let on that anything was wrong, even though my mind was in turmoil. Tracy kept up her usual cheerful demeanor, probably thinking that everything was fine. But there was a growing distance between us, and she wasn't doing anything. To Bridget. About a week later, I met with an attorney. As soon as I mentioned Tracy's position at the law firm, the lawyer looked uncomfortable, so I moved on to the next one on my list. The second attorney was a younger woman in her early 30s who simply smiled when I mentioned Tracy's job. That was the kind of lawyer I needed. Someone who wouldn't be intimidated if Tracy's firm took on her case. I shared what little I knew about the situation starting with the fact that my youngest child wasn't biologically mine and was, in fact, Mike Thompson's daughter. The lawyer, Beth Turner, raised an eyebrow and asked, The Mike Thompson who's a judge? I nodded, watching her carefully to gauge her reaction. She didn't seem phased, which was a good sign. We discussed the financial implications, given that both Tracy and I had solid jobs, pensions, and benefits. 
Beth suggested we split our joint assets evenly, keep our pensions separate, and sell the house. This would leave both of us financially secure, though I'd be in a slightly better position due to my higher income and pension. Beth added that unless I was dead set on seeking revenge for Tracy's betrayal, we could settle things relatively quickly. I assured her that I didn't want to harm Tracy financially, despite feeling betrayed. Beth then inquired about taking legal action against Mike, noting that it would be complicated and time-consuming. I responded, perhaps a bit harshly, that Mike was my concern and I would handle it in my way. Beth understood and mentioned that if Tracy didn't contest, the divorce could be finalized in about seven months, but if she did, it might take more than a year. I told her I wasn't in a rush and to take her time to do things right. With the legal matters sorted out, it was time to confront Tracy. I waited another week to see if her conscience would prompt her to come clean. Saturday night was our usual date night, followed by watching a movie together. But after finding out about Leah's true parentage, I couldn't bring myself to go through with it. Tracy didn't question my reluctance, which was another sign that she knew I had figured it out, but she was good at pretending everything was normal. However, that was about to change. I decided to take her to a fancy Italian restaurant, where we shared a bottle of wine and some decadent desserts. Tracy seemed happier than she had been in weeks, which made what I was about to do even harder. When we got home, I helped her out of her coat, guided her to the dining room table, and pulled out a chair for her. We need to talk, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Tracy gave me a half-smile as I poured myself a glass of bourbon and offered her a drink, which she declined. Once we were both seated, I locked eyes with her and said, The floor is yours. Tracy hesitated before reminding me that it had been over 19 years since she and Mike were involved, asking if we could consider it a mistake from the distant past and move on. I was relieved that she didn't deny the DNA results, but was taken aback by her attempt to downplay the affair as ancient history. I pressed her for details, asking about the timeline and frequency of her relationship with Mike and whether our other children, David and Emily, were also his. Tracy assured me that David and Emily were mine and explained that her affair with Mike began about a year after Emily was born and lasted around two years. She said it ended when Mike left the firm to pursue his judicial career, making sure his background was spotless. After they broke up, they only saw each other a few times when Tracy took the kids to the lake cabin. Liz, Mike's wife, initially had no idea, but eventually, she found out. Tracy mentioned that they had a meeting with Liz, where they promised there would be no further intimacy. Frustrated, I asked Tracy why she never tried to have an honest conversation with me. Was I just your backup plan? I demanded. Tracy wiped her hands on her jeans and said she knew she could never tell me because I would have filed for divorce immediately. She claimed that she loved me then and still does. I couldn't help but point out that it seemed like she loved Mike more, starting and stopping with him at his command while treating me like a fallback option. Tracy protested, insisting that she loved me with all her heart. In response, I accused her of loving Mike with all her heart, sacrificing their relationship for his career while keeping me as her safety net. I pointed out that while she might have had some love for me, she knew how much I adored her and how much I relied on our family to cope with his absence. Tracy's gaze dropped to her lap, and it seemed like she couldn't argue against that painful truth. Regarding Leah, Tracy admitted that during her affair with Mike, she hadn't considered the consequences until the DNA test revealed the truth. She assumed that since both she and Mike had dark hair, brown eyes, and fair skin, no one would suspect Leah's paternity. She figured I wouldn't question it, especially since Leah resembled her. She never imagined the DNA test would uncover the truth. I was incredulous. You mean you weren't sure until the DNA test? I asked. Tracy explained that she and Mike had discussed the possibility that Leah was his, but she reassured him not to worry because Leah looked like me. She mentioned that Mike might not have known for sure either, but probably figured it out by now. Tracy emphasized that regardless of biology, Leah was still hers. She carried her, gave birth to her, and raised her. She insisted that Mike had no claim over Leah and that if he ever tried, she would fight him tooth and nail. I told Tracy that I intended to have David and Emily undergo DNA testing as soon as possible. I need to know for my peace of mind, I explained. Tracy pleaded with me to trust her, saying that I already knew they were mine. I shot back, how can I trust you now? 
My tone clearly showed my newfound distrust, which seemed to take Tracy by surprise. She was also visibly shaken by the idea of me telling David and Emily about her affair. Understandably, she didn't want them to think of her as unfaithful. I changed the subject, asking about the details of her relationship with Mike, how often they met and where. Tracy explained that their relationship wasn't something they planned. It developed from spending time together at work, starting as a friendship and then becoming something more. She described Mike as kind, considerate, funny, and passionate, someone with whom she had a deep connection. Since they both loved their spouses, they kept their meetings discreet, usually out of town, never at our house. Tracy assured me they hadn't been intimate since the affair ended. When I asked if Liz knew about all this and had forgiven them, Tracy confirmed she did. I whispered, my voice filled with uncertainty. I don't know if I can go back to the way things were. Tracy tried to reassure me, acknowledging the wrongness of their actions, but emphasizing that it had been over for nearly two decades and I hadn't suffered while it was happening. She pleaded for us to return to our lives from just a few weeks ago, where I was her loving husband and she my loving wife, insisting that nothing had to change. I firmly told Tracy that things had already changed. I shared that I had spent the better part of two weeks wondering what I had done wrong for her to fall in love with another man, questioning whether I could ever fully trust her again, let alone enough to stay married. I expressed with heavy emotion that I had given her my heart completely, and yet she treated it as something to be taken out only when it suited her. I stressed that our marriage wasn't supposed to be one of convenience, but rather a commitment of unwavering love. At this point, Tracy began to cry. Typically, I would have tried to console her, but this time felt different. I retreated to the living room, turned on the TV, and left her alone at the dining room table. That night we shared the same bed, but for the first time in a long while, we didn't cuddle. I moved as far away from her as I could in our bed and didn't let her snuggle up to me when she joined me. Her face showed a mix of surprise and pain, but I didn't really care. The next morning, as Tracy prepared breakfast, I brought up the topic of divorce. She practically shouted at me, arguing that the affair happened nearly 20 years ago and that I hadn't even known about it, so why couldn't we just move on? I responded by yelling back, emphasizing that a mistake remains a mistake, no matter how long ago it occurred. I told her I felt betrayed, pointing out how she deceived me, lied to me, and cheated on me, violating my trust. I highlighted that these weren't temporary problems. Unable to continue the conversation, I got up from the table, leaving my food unfinished, and headed outside to mow the lawn. That was the last time I spoke to Tracy until Thursday afternoon, when she informed me that Liz Thompson would be visiting us next weekend. Needless to say, I wasn't thrilled, but Liz was an old and dear friend who had gone through the same ordeal as I had, so I thought it might be worth talking to her. On Saturday night, Liz showed up after driving nearly three hours from her home. Surprisingly, she didn't bring Mike with her. During dinner, our conversation was light and friendly, but afterward, we moved to the living room with glasses of wine, ready to dive into the main issue. Liz started talking about the affair, as if it were some distant historical event, speaking calmly and dispassionately. However, as she continued, her emotions intensified, and tears welled up in both hers and Tracy's eyes. Liz shared that when Mike confessed to the affair, she assumed it had ended years ago and he assured her it wouldn't happen again. She admitted that she was devastated at first, but after thinking it over, she realized that since it was over before she even knew about it, she wasn't hurt too badly. Knowing Liz wasn't a vengeful person, I could see how she had come to terms with it. Mike's charm was undeniable, and while I had only recently discovered the truth about Leah, I understood why Liz might have forgiven him. Liz never brought up the times Tracy and Mike met after their initial affair, particularly at their lake cabin. I wondered if she knew about those occasions, but chose not to ask. It did make me think, though, that Mike must be a skilled lawyer because Liz seemed almost apologetic for his affair, rather than being upset with him. Unfortunately for Tracy, I wasn't as forgiving as Liz, and I wasn't inclined to let Tracy and Mike off the hook, even though their affair had spanned nearly two decades. I often wonder what my life would be like if I left him and how it would affect me and the kids. Liz continued. They say you should always weigh whether your life would improve or worsen without your spouse. In my case, I believe it would be worse. Thanks for sharing your perspective, Liz.
It's definitely something to think about, I replied. I'll need to carefully consider it. There are several factors at play, including the fact that, unlike you, I wasn't informed about the affair. I stumbled upon it entirely by accident. Tracy knew it was wrong when she got involved with Mike, and she anticipated my reaction. She thought it would be better if I never found out and just lived in ignorance. That might have worked if it weren't for the DNA test. Now, nearly two decades later, I've learned that the love of my life had an intimate relationship with another man before coming back to me. Throughout Liz's story, Tracy remained silent, listening intently as Liz spoke. Tracy couldn't have known that I was aware of her anxious glances in my direction, so I sat casually, occasionally nodding, just to keep her on edge. My response to Liz's story wasn't what Tracy had hoped for, nor was it what Liz expected. They exchanged sorrowful glances, realizing that I wasn't reacting the way they had anticipated. I shook my head, got up to pour myself another glass of wine, returned to the living room, and turned on the TV. It was a clear signal that our conversation was over for the night. The next day, Liz cornered me in the living room, saying we needed to talk. I didn't know where Tracy was, but I agreed, and we relocated to the family room, settling into chairs in the corner. Liz began by saying she understood my pain, but argued that not forgiving Tracy and divorcing her would be a huge mistake for both of us. She emphasized that our love for each other should be what mattered most, and that the past was just that, the past. She pointed out that it would be tragic for us to spend the rest of our lives apart over something that happened nearly two decades ago. Liz mentioned that if she could forgive Mike, I could surely forgive Tracy too. I replied honestly, Liz, I don't know if I can forgive Tracy. Unlike you, she never told me about the affair. Tracy knew it was wrong, and she knew I wouldn't have forgiven her back then. So why should I forgive her now? The deception isn't just about the affair. It's about the years of lies. The years she let me believe we had something that we didn't. I shook my head, stood up, and walked out of the room, passing Tracy in the hallway. She could see from my expression that I wasn't budging. Dinner that night was quiet. The women tried to make small talk, but I wasn't interested. I barely said a word, and after thanking them for the meal, I grabbed my coat and left, telling them I'd be at Finnegan's, my favorite bar. At Finnegan's, I felt down and chose a table in the back instead of my usual spot at the bar. The owner, Sheila, who's like a sister to me, noticed my mood and came over to see what was wrong. I told her that Tracy had cheated on me, and our youngest wasn't mine. She was shocked and offered her blunt perspective, which I appreciated. Sheila asked if Tracy had apologized for the affair or just for getting caught. I realized Tracy hadn't really apologized. Sheila then offered me a few free drinks and arranged for a cab to take me home, taking my keys for safekeeping. The cab dropped me off at home around 3 o'clock in the morning. Tracy was waiting for me at the door and helped me upstairs to our bedroom. I collapsed onto the bed, fully clothed, and she took off my shoes and socks. That's how I slept. Late the next afternoon, my son David called me at the office. He wanted to talk about the situation with Tracy. He didn't come right out and say it, but it was clear that Tracy had involved the kids to sway me away from divorce. David and I usually see eye to eye on most things, but from our conversation, it was obvious that Tracy had put in some effort and that it had paid off. He was definitely on her side. I had to explain things to him firmly. I said, what she did might have been a mistake at first, but after continuing for months, it became a choice. How would you feel if you found out your wife, Sarah, had been cheating on you for years? The affair might have ended, but the lies and disrespect didn't. I think you should stay out of this, David. You're getting involved in something you shouldn't. I was frustrated, feeling betrayed after idolizing my wife for so long, only to find out she had kept this secret. If it hadn't been for that DNA test, I'd still be in the dark. It felt like she used me as a backup plan. As David tried to argue that I was overreacting, I hung up, feeling that the conversation wasn't going anywhere. When I got home that evening, Tracy was busy preparing a delicious meal. She didn't look pleased when I told her I wasn't hungry. I poured myself a glass of bourbon, turned on the TV, and settled into my favorite chair. Tracy came in and asked what was wrong. Same old stuff, different day. My wife cheats on me for years, has a kid with another man, and now our kids are making me out to be the bad guy here. Do me a favor, 
Call Emily tonight and tell her not to call me tomorrow unless she wants to be hung up on, like David was? Tracy lowered her eyes. You'd think after 29 years, she'd know not to provoke me on her behalf. What makes you think this divorce isn't happening? I said, raising my voice. Not only did you cheat on me for years and have a child with another man, but you also replaced me in your heart with him. You can sit here and tell me you weren't in love with him, that if he had asked you to leave me and marry him, you wouldn't have done it. But the truth is, you may love me, but you're not in love with me. You're in love with him. I was just the reliable backup because you've always known my heart belongs to you, and I'd do anything to keep you as mine. You cheated on me, lied to me, disrespected me, and now you have the nerve to try to turn our children against me. That was the final straw, Tracy. But I won't seek revenge against you or Liz, and I won't destroy Mike's promising career as an upstanding judge. I'm filing for divorce on the grounds of irreconcilable differences. We can each keep our retirement accounts, and we'll split everything else, including the house, down the middle. Tracy burst into tears and got up from her chair, but I couldn't help adding another jab. You never mentioned regretting your affair, probably because you don't regret it. The only thing you regret is that I found out, isn't it? I spent the rest of the evening with a bottle of bourbon. The next day, I contacted Beth Turner and told her to prepare the divorce papers as quickly as possible. She mentioned that I could review them by the following Friday and that they'd be ready for the following Monday. Tracy could be served the following Tuesday, but I insisted that her process server come to our house on Wednesday night. I wanted to be there when she received the papers. Next, I called Mike Thompson's office and let his assistant know I needed him to return my call about an urgent matter. He understood why I was calling, and I was sure he'd call back quickly. When Mike called me a couple of hours later, he sounded nervous. He knew exactly what I was getting at, but preferred not to discuss it at his office. I agreed, telling him I'd be at his house the following Sunday at 10 a.m. He didn't know yet that Tracy would be served the night before, but I was sure he'd find out by the time I made the two-hour drive to his upscale neighborhood. During dinner at Finnegan's on Sunday night, Tracy mentioned that Liz had called her to tell her about my upcoming meeting with Mike the following Sunday. Tracy asked if I wanted her to come with me. I pointed out that this wasn't just a casual conversation. Mike and I had serious matters to discuss, and her presence wasn't necessary. I reminded her that Mike was an appeals court judge with a spotless reputation, possibly in the running for a seat on the Supreme Court. Any confrontation could have legal consequences. Besides, she had promised not to do anything that could harm his career. Tracy retorted with a hint of jealousy, but I reassured her that I intended to keep my promise and not jeopardize Mike's future prospects. After confiding in Hank about my situation, I took a few personal hours to meet with Beth and review the divorce papers. I gave her the go-ahead. As I was about to leave, she asked if I had any plans concerning Mike. Puzzled, I asked why she was concerned. She replied, because I still handle some criminal cases and I thought you might need a good lawyer. Engineers might not get too emotional about many things, but your methodical approach can be intimidating. She handed me her business card, and I left her office. The next few days passed in a blur. We had a major project at work, which gave me something to focus on besides my personal life. Even Hank commented on how focused I was despite everything I was going through. I told him it was a relief that at least one thing was going smoothly. However, on Friday evening before I left the office, I confided in Hank about Tracy being served with divorce papers and my upcoming meeting with Mike. I warned him that if things went south, I might end up in jail by Monday. He assured me of his support and even offered to bail me out if needed. We parted with a firm handshake. When I got home that evening, I was greeted by the aroma of yet another delicious meal that Tracy was preparing. She had been going out of her way lately to show off her cooking skills, and I had to admit she was a fantastic cook. Despite the tension that had plagued our meals for the past few weeks, I made sure to thank her for the wonderful dinner. After dinner, as we were about to move to the living room for some TV, the doorbell rang. It was nearly 8.30, and I had a feeling it wasn't for me, so I stayed put. Tracy, on the other hand, flashed me a quick look and went to answer the door. She opened it to find a well-dressed young woman who asked if she was Tracy Carter. Confirming her identity, Tracy received a large manila envelope from her. With a brief statement, the woman said, You've been served. 
then quickly walked away. Tracy remained motionless for a moment, but the slump in her shoulders and the tears in her eyes spoke volumes. I walked past her, closed the front door, and gently guided her to the kitchen table. She looked utterly shaken, just as I had anticipated. We sat in silence for what felt like an eternity, though it was probably only a few minutes. Finally, she muttered, you jerk, and fled upstairs to our bedroom. I chose not to follow her. The most challenging part was behind me. That night, for one of the few times since our marriage, I didn't sleep in the same bed as Tracy. Instead, I went to the guest bedroom we had set up. Although I wouldn't describe it as sleep, I at least tried to rest. The woman I had considered my soulmate, my everything, for nearly three decades was still sharing a house with me, despite everything that had happened. I suppose neither of us wanted to be the first to make a move, but now, at least in my mind, it was all over. The next morning, I got up, took a shower, and dressed quietly, careful not to disturb Tracy or provoke any confrontation. I didn't bother checking if she was awake. I just gathered my things and left. My attire was my usual, jeans, a decent shirt, and the custom-made leather boots I bought during a visit to my son's place in Phoenix. I left earlier than necessary because I wanted to make sure I wasn't late for the meeting. If I arrived early, I could always kill some time at a nearby diner, which is what I did. I arrived at Mike and Liz's house right at 10 o'clock and rang the doorbell. Liz, always looking lovely though clearly anxious, opened the door. I'm sorry it had to come to this, was all I could manage to say as she leaned in for a hug. She didn't respond verbally but took my hand and led me into a room filled with Mike's awards and photos. Mike was seated in his favorite chair, but he stood up as we walked in. Hey Greg. Hey Mike, I replied. Liz, looking very uneasy, left the room. We stood about eight feet apart, sizing each other up. There was a time when I considered Mike almost like an older brother. That's how close we were. Mike was three years my senior, roughly the same height, but the comforts of the past few decades had added about 40 pounds to his frame, most of it settling around his waist. We had shared our dreams, gone on fishing and hunting trips together, and I had been proud to call him a friend. I was equally proud of his accomplishments in his career as a judge. But now, standing before me, his expression was no longer that of a friend but an adversary. I felt a surge of anger. You've got my wife's heart, you jerk. I shouted at him. You also get to keep your perfect public image because I promised Tracy I wouldn't tell anyone about this, and I don't break promises to her. But you won't keep your dignity. With that, I took a large step forward, planted my left foot, and delivered a powerful upward kick straight to his groin. Mike's reaction was slower than I expected, and my boot hit its target with precision. I could feel the impact, and then I heard him howl in agony as he crumpled to the floor, clutching himself and crying out in pain. In that moment, all my rage and frustration boiled over. Liz rushed into the room, seeing her husband writhing on the floor. She tried to comfort him, but his cries only grew louder. She looked at me, her eyes filled with fear. I reached for my phone, dialed 911, and calmly said, There's been an accident at Judge Mike Thompson's house. We need an ambulance. I turned to leave, but just as I reached the door, Liz grabbed my arm. I thought I might have to defend myself, but instead of panic or anger, she had a strangely calm expression on her face. She hugged me tightly and whispered, Thank you. We know what needs to be done. I hugged her back, left the house, got in my car, and drove home, confident that the police wouldn't be coming after me. Liz understood and she'd explain things to Mike when he could think straight. The drive home was a mix of relief and uncertainty. After weeks of daily heartache, I finally felt a weight lift off my shoulders. It's funny how discovering Tracy's betrayal actually freed me to think clearly and do what was best for myself. It might not have been the right choice for everyone, but sometimes you have to prioritize your own well-being. That's what everyone else had been doing for decades, so why shouldn't I? Sure. A part of me would always care for Tracy, but I wasn't going to let this chapter define my life anymore. It wasn't my fault, and it wasn't my choice. It was time to move forward. When I got home, I went to the basement, grabbed a couple of suitcases, and headed to our bedroom. Tracy followed me from the living room, asking, So, that's it then? That's it, I replied. Twenty-nine years and out the door. Tracy, 
It's a shame you're so wrapped up in yourself that you can't see how you deceived me, how you stole nearly a quarter of a century of my love through your lies. But I'm past it now. I don't hate you. I don't even hate Mike, though he probably thinks I do right now. I'll mend things with David and Emily eventually. You should work on repairing your relationship with Leah as soon as possible. They deserve better. I continued, sign the papers, Tracy, and let's put this behind us. I'll have the rest of my things out in the next few days. We don't need to talk anymore. If you have anything to say to me, my lawyer's business card is on the kitchen table. She stood there in shock, tears welling up, but no words coming out. I grabbed my suitcases, walked back downstairs, and stashed them in the trunk of my car. After returning to the house, I packed up a few more things and left. 29 years, just like that. In the end, I lied. As it turns out, Mike managed to save one of his testicles after all. It required extensive surgery and months of recovery, but they succeeded in saving one. I learned about it from Leah, who had been contacted by Liz trying to reach me. Liz didn't have my new phone number, and the rest of the family wasn't interested in telling her. In fact, they haven't spoken to me in over six months now, but I've come to terms with it. According to the official story, Judge Mike Thompson had an accident in his home, falling onto the edge of his desk and landing awkwardly twice. The media played it down, calling it a domestic accident, conveniently omitting the details of his injury. Surprisingly, he received a lot of sympathetic coverage. I guess even this won't affect his chances of being on the Supreme Court shortlist. Tracy signed the divorce papers within a week, and the divorce was finalized last week. The house will be sold, and Tracy hasn't tried to contact me since I left. Neither have David or Emily. It looks like I won't be invited to the family Christmas gathering this year, wherever they decide to have it. Hank is passing the company reins to me at the start of next year as he heads into retirement. Per our agreement, I'll need to run the company for eight years before I can retire comfortably with a substantial golden parachute. After that, Hank plans to find a buyer for the company, and I'll get 15% of the sale. I've started going out and dating again. After being married for what felt like an eternity, it's going to take some time to get the hang of things, but I'm optimistic. Interestingly, news of my divorce spread quickly, and quite a few divorced friends have reached out, expressing interest. Even a couple of Tracy's divorced friends have called, surprised that she let me go at all. I must admit, it's been a nice boost to my confidence. I see a bright future ahead, full of professional and personal challenges. During my free time, I'm exploring new hobbies and interests. One thing I've definitely given up on, though, is genealogy. I used to be passionate about it, but that's no longer a pursuit of mine.